Being a single mother is the hardest job in the world. You have to work so hard to provide for your child, all the while still wanting to find that special someone that you can spend your life with. Having a child doesn't mean you suddenly stop wanting that connection. But at the same time, you have to be that much more careful of who you can trust. Because as so many of us know, there are people out there who will take advantage of a struggling mother at the first chance, and the results can be devastating. But before we get into this case, I wanna talk about one way that we can help keep ourselves safe from scammers, spammers, and data brokers, and anyone else who may want to target you and hurt you. Your full name, email, home address, health records, your family members, all that information is out there on the internet for anyone to see, and that is why I started using Aura, the sponsor of today's video. Aura helps keep me and my information safe by showing me which data brokers are selling my information and automatically submits opt-out requests for me. Cleaning up my information from the web has helped me to reduce the amount of spam I get, which was a lot, and helps protect me from hackers who could use this information to access my accounts on social media, my bank accounts, or any other sources of sensitive information. When I saw just how much of my personal information was out there for anybody to see, I was absolutely shocked. Actually, multiple of my social media accounts got hacked last year. It was so bad. I I almost completely lost access to my accounts if I didn't act fast, and it was terrifying. I had someone messaging my family members on Facebook, asking for money, trying to trick my grandma into thinking I was in danger. It was terrible. But now I can feel so much more at ease with Aura knowing that hackers can no longer access my information. Once I set up my account with Aura, they found 16 different sites that were selling my information and started working immediately to protect my privacy. This means removing my phone number and addresses from unwanted sites, leading to reduced spam calls, spam mail, and honestly, peace of mind knowing that my data is being protected. But Aura does so much more than protect me from online threats that I can't see. With Aura, I get other features like antivirus, VPN, password management, identity theft insurance, and so much more, all within just one app. Even if you already have one of those tools, like a VPN, not having Aura is like locking your front door, but keeping your back door wide open. Aura is a one-stop shop for everything you need to protect yourself and your information. Aura is really easy to set up, it's super user-friendly, and the best part is that you get it all at one affordable price. Aura is always on doing the hard work to keep me safe so I can focus on other tasks, not worrying about my accounts being hacked and losing everything I worked so hard for. To me, that is priceless. I value my privacy and I value yours too. To keep yourself and your information safe, head to aura.com slash Rachel Shannon to start your two week free trial today. Once again, click the link in the description box below and head to aura.com slash Rachel Shannon for your two week free trial today. Thank you again so much to Aura for partnering with me on today's video. One more announcement that I wanted to make before I get started with this case is that I will now be uploading all of my YouTube videos to Spotify so that anybody who wants to listen to episodes while driving or while doing daily tasks like chores and things like that, you can now just listen to it on audio on Spotify. It's under the name True Crime with Rachel Shannon, so make sure you go ahead and check that out. The episodes will be released every Sunday with the first episode coming out March 31st. I am so excited to be expanding it to yet another new platform to expand these stories and get them to more listeners. So go ahead and check those episodes out and let me know what you guys think. With all of that being said, let's get into this tragic case. Today, we will be discussing the murders of Jasmine Lovett and Aaliyah Sanderson. 25-year-old Jasmine Lovett was living in the suburbs of Calgary in Alberta, Canada with her 22-month-old daughter, Aaliyah Sanderson. Jasmine was described as a very special person. She had a quirky sense of humor and loved to play pranks. Her favorite day of the year was April Fool's Day, which I feel like can really just speak to her fun-loving and carefree personality. She was known as being thoughtful and kind, giving you the shirt off her back if you needed it. She lived each and every day to the best of her ability and to be the best mother that she possibly could to her baby daughter. However, shortly after Aaliyah's birth, Jasmine and Aaliyah's father, Robbie 
Sanderson split up. And from what I've been able to find through my research, it does not seem like Robbie was all that involved in Jasmine or Aaliyah's lives after the split. So now, all of a sudden, Jasmine was a single mother to a young daughter with little to no help in raising her. So, after a few months, Jasmine took to dating apps to get back out there and find her new love. It was on the dating apps that she connected with a 34-year-old man named Robert Leeming. Robert Leeming was born to English parents with his father being in the British military. So technically, he was born on a base in Germany, but he spent most of his time growing up in rural England alongside his two brothers, Christopher and George. By all accounts, he had a normal middle-class upbringing with parents who did their best to raise him. He then went to trade school, learning how to fix cars as a mechanic. As an adult, Robert started speaking with a woman from Canada who he ultimately fell in love with and started a relationship with. After that, Robert applied for citizenship in Canada, which was granted. So, he uprooted his life from England, moving across the pond to Calgary, Canada, continuing his work as a mechanic. There, he could be with his new love, Sarah. By February of 2013, the two were married and bought a home together. After that, Sarah fell pregnant and the two had a son together and to complete their family, they adopted a dog. For a while, the two lived an idyllic, quiet life with their baby and dog. But the relationship between he and his wife didn't last long and unfortunately, by 2017, the two split up. After that, Sarah had primary custody of their then three-year-old son and Robert was allowed supervised visits. Of course, when Robert first met Jasmine, the fact that they were both going through similar struggles, both recently single and dealing with having to be a single parent, the two bonded. Eventually, the two started a more casual relationship. However, about a month into their relationship, Jasmine found herself dealing with some housing issues, rendering her on the verge of homelessness. So, they came to the mutual decision that Jasmine would be able to live with Robert in his home. There, she had her own room and contributed some money to the rent to help out. After moving in, by all accounts, the two appeared to have a very stable relationship. Jasmine was always very supportive of Robert when it came to his issues with his son, and Robert was happy to help Jasmine take care of Aaliyah anytime she had to be out of the house. It seemed like a very fair and equal partnership that worked well. They supported each other, and Jasmine really felt like she was finally in a stable spot in her life. This lifestyle did not last long, though. Turns out that Robert was not the person Jasmine thought he was. He started showing some really concerning behaviors, which really drove Jasmine away. But these behaviors were nothing new. He had a truly dark and disturbing past that Jasmine knew nothing of. Like I said, Robert had previously been married before his relationship ended four years later. Turns out the reasons for the divorce were very much justified because the way Robert acted is just horrific. According to Robert's ex-wife, Sarah, Robert emotionally destroyed her during the course of their relationship and caused her to fear for her and her child's safety. He would emotionally abuse his ex-wife, saying that she was crazy, she was useless and worthless. He would gaslight her and make her feel like everything was always her fault. He apparently told her that she ruined his life by having a baby and having a dog he hated, completely blaming her for his his lack of satisfaction with his life. At the time, he did have diabetes and was taking medication for it, but somehow, even the diabetes was her fault. Outside of the relationship, he was having issues at work. He couldn't hold down a job and was accused of stealing from work on multiple occasions. He also started using drugs like marijuana and was drinking alcohol almost daily. He was also a very absent and neglectful father. There was one time where Sarah was at work and Robert's family was coming into town to visit them. Well, when he went to pick up his parents from the airport, he left his infant son home alone with nobody there to watch him. Another time, Sarah, Robert, and other family members were eating together at a restaurant when their son became fussy. So, Robert took him outside to calm him down, but... Robert returned to the restaurant without their son. Of course, Sarah freaked out and ran outside to find their son. 
Robert had left him outside crying in the snowy negative 10 degrees weather all by himself as a little baby. Robert also had a very disturbing fascination with weapons. According to Robert, he has enjoyed collecting knives from the time that he was five years old. And apparently, as a little five-year-old, Robert's parents weren't all that concerned and allowed him to continue this collection. Well, by adulthood, he had over 60 different blades, ranging from a half inch to eight inches. He also had multiple guns, which he kept in a vault within their home. So to me, the weapons part isn't a huge red flag. Sometimes people just have those hobbies, but all of these behaviors combined with the fact that he had all those weapons made things very scary for Sarah. Then to top everything off, near the end of their marriage, Robert tried getting rid of their dog, Axel, by taking him outside to a secluded area in the mountains tying him to a tree, and then leaving him there for four days without food or water to die. Luckily, just by happenstance, the owner of a nearby property went outside to inspect the area and happened to find Axel tied to a tree. Thank God. So, the dog didn't die, but it was fully Robert's intent for the dog to die. For this, he was charged with two counts of failing to provide proper care for an animal and one count of causing an animal distress. For this, he was fined $5,000 and banned from owning an animal for 10 years, which, if you ask me, is a ridiculously light sentence, and I think anyone who does something so cruel to an animal should be sentenced to prison but that's just me. Either way, when he was in court and he was asked why he did this, he just said that the dog was causing trouble in the home, chewing on everything. So, because the dog was a troublemaker, instead of surrendering him to the Humane Society, he left him outside in the elements to die. So, all of this, Robert's verbal abuse and gaslighting, his lack of regard for his dog or even his child, his inability to keep a job, and his drug use. All of that caused a lot of strain on the relationship, understandably. The two did try marriage counseling for about a month before they split, but of course, it was not useful. You really can't change someone who has no regard for anyone or anything around him. So, they got divorced. Even the process of getting divorced was a nightmare for Sarah. Even though he showed no interest in taking care of his son and even tried killing their dog, he still fought Sarah for custody of their three-year-old little boy. They also fought over who gets the home. In the court documents, Robert claimed that his wife was always mentally ill and emotionally unstable. He said that all throughout their marriage, his wife constantly accused him of cheating on her just because he got home from work late. She was quite unstable, which can be seen by those accusations. He denied any and all accusations that Sarah made that he can't take care of his son, saying that he provides for him and is a perfectly fit father. However, in the end, as we know, Sarah was granted custody of their child. Meanwhile, Robert got to keep their home, which was where he was now living with Jasmine and her baby girl. But, as I stated, after a short time of living with Robert and having a smooth relationship, things started to get rocky with Jasmine. Jasmine noticed a shift in Robert's behaviors, and in her gut, she felt like Robert was probably seeing other women. Call it women's intuition or whatever you want to say, but I feel like women can just tell when their partner starts acting differently, and you can just tell in your gut when they're cheating. That is how Jasmine started to feel. So, she did confront Robert about this, and of course, he denied it, but as we would later find out, he had re-downloaded all sorts of dating apps and was, in fact, seeing other women, a lot of other women. This caused their relationship to go downhill, but they still wanted to put on a united front, showing friends and family members that their relationship was just fine. Robert even came with Jasmine to family gatherings where he would interact with everybody and play with Aaliyah, everything he was expected to do. While living with Robert, Jasmine still made sure to stay in regular contact with her family, whether it was over the phone, via calling or texting, or in person. They didn't necessarily talk every single day, 
but they did talk on most days. By April 23rd, 2019, Jasmine had plans to meet her mother and sister for dinner, but she didn't show up. When her sister tried calling her to see what was going on, Jasmine wouldn't answer the phone. They tried contacting her multiple times, but it was of no use. This was very unusual for Jasmine because she was always good about showing up to plans, and if she couldn't make something, she would at least tell someone that she wasn't going to be there. Even though this was very strange though, at the time, they thought that maybe she had just lost track of time and forgot about the plans, maybe she just needed a break and needed some time to herself. They knew that she was going through some relationship issues, so maybe she just needed to take time. So even though this was very unusual, they weren't panicked just yet. But when two more days passed with absolutely no contact from Jasmine, her mother Kim started to get really worried. She decided to go over to Jasmine's house to see what was going on, and when she got there, she thought that everything looked relatively normal. Aaliyah's toys were scattered all around the outside areas, and nothing looked out of place. But when she went to the door to knock and physically see Jasmine, nobody answered. So she left and waited another two days, hoping that Jasmine would contact her soon and that all of this would be just a big misunderstanding. But when she still heard no word from Jasmine after five days of no contact, on April 23rd, Kim went to the police station to file a missing persons report. And pretty soon after, police started their investigation. The following day, on April 24th, police headed over to Robert's home, which was listed as Jasmine's last known residence. They also knocked on the door, but got no answer. So, they left a notice on the door and went back to their car to wait and see if Robert would arrive home. But he didn't. But as time passed and it got darker outside, officers noticed that the lights inside the home were being turned on and off, indicating to officers that somebody was home. So, they went up to the door again, this time knocking a lot more incessantly and yelling out for Robert to come to the door. Finally, this worked and Robert answered. When he answered, it was clear to officers immediately that he was under the influence. He admitted to officers that he had been drinking and smoking all day. When officers got inside the home, he told them that the reason he didn't answer the door even though he was home all day was because he was drinking and smoking and just wasn't paying attention. He told officers that he doesn't know where Jasmine is, saying that he thought Jasmine was with her mother and sister. But of course, that did not make any sense because they were the ones who reported her as missing. He at first denied that they had any arguments recently, but then he went on to say that they got into a huge fight three weeks ago where she started throwing his stuff out of the house and threatened to move out. But other than that, there hasn't been anything else that concerned him. He also denied that they were in a relationship, saying that she was more of a roommate than a girlfriend. This definitely surprised the officers. Honestly, nothing he was saying was making any sense, and all of it was a huge red flag for them. Hmm. Well, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. All right. Well, we're just going to take a quick look around. We need to have a look. So, sir, are you Robert? Yeah, Okay. So... I was sleeping. I sleep with plugs in and... Hey, well, we've been here for hours and hours and hours now, hey? Uh, banging on your door and... Ringing on the doorbell. Calling your door phone. Door again. I'm, I'm, I've been drinking and smoking a lot, so... I'm okay. Okay, so... She's not with her sister. That's the reason that we're here. Why do you think we're here? Because the family's calling us, saying we haven't heard from our daughter and our sister. Yeah, it makes sense. Okay, that makes sense? Yeah. Okay, why does that make sense? Because I haven't heard from her either. Okay. So, do you guys get in some sort of argument? No, not that I'm aware of. 
not that you're aware of. Like, you're not making a whole lot of sense no, to me, like, guy. Like, like, I don't know what. What? what uh, sorry, I'm, I'm still getting my bearings here. So she's not with her family, but she did threaten to move out. three weeks ago, we got into a, a tizzy, she, she threw a bunch of my stuff out, food, stuff like that, and I had a disagreement about that. Um, but nothing like that would concern me. Nothing that would concern you, okay. Like, I mean, I've, I've, had, I've had people living with me before, and they move out. Don't right, but this isn't just like a roommate. This is your girlfriend. No, it's more roommate than girlfriend. Okay. She's more of a roommate than a girlfriend? Yeah. Okay, so... The last time that you saw Jasmine was when? Thursday. Okay. And at that time, you guys were A-OK -okay or fighting, or what was the status? I would say in the air. Judging by what obviously has gone down. Neither hers and she's not here, and we're looking for her, so... So what makes you believe that she's with her sister? She told me that, that she was going to go and spend Easter with them on Tuesday. I was talking about it because I don't have my son, so, you know, it's kind of depressed about that. But just, you know, drink, a lot of drinking a lot over the weekend because I've pretty much been on my own, right? Okay. Does she have a car? I don't know. No, she doesn't have a license. Sorry. Right. 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 We got a phone number for the sister. No, I'll have to phone mom and start digging, but that doesn't jive. What's the slam wrap for? No. Just privacy. Huh? Privacy. Did you see the note on the door? I do now. Immediately after speaking with Robert, they knew that something suspicious was going on here. Clearly, his behaviors were concerning and he was not making any sense whatsoever. So, by the following day, police did obtain a search warrant to search Robert's home for any and all evidence. By the early afternoon on April 25th, officers arrived to the home to execute their search warrant. At this time, when they showed up, they were unable to make entry through the front door. They tried kicking in the door and pushing it open, but nothing was working. So, they went in through the back door and made their way up to the front. That is when they saw that Robert had put up barricades to prevent the door from opening. He had put up those poles that you can get when you live alone to prevent intruders from coming in and put those against his front door. Then, as they looked around the house, they found something very unusual. They found that Robert had scattered strips of raw bacon all around the home. There was a piece on a vent near the front door, and there was another piece draped over the back of a dining room chair. There was also a large chunk of bacon found under the cover of a dry sump pump hole in the basement floor. There was also a large amount of bacon on the top of the garbage can in the kitchen, still in its container. All of the bacon that was scattered around the home appeared fresh, like it had just recently been placed there. Officers actually had to pry the lid of the sump pump hole open, and that bacon was also very fresh. So clearly, it was just put there. Very, very strange. In addition to all of that, they found that there was a pin code door lock on the door to the master bedroom. That is where he kept his guns, but they were stored in a container in the room, so it was very strange to investigators that he would padlock the entire master bedroom shut. Even though all of this that they were finding was very strange, 
they actually didn't find any information that could lead them to any solid answers about where Jasmine and her baby Aaliyah had gone. Of course, while investigators were executing the search warrant, Robert had been arrested and taken into the station for questioning. In that interview, Robert told officers that the last time he saw Jasmine and Aaliyah was on the 17th when they went out for a picnic near Bragg Creek. After the picnic, they went out for beers before returning home. He said that Jasmine stayed at home until the following day when Robert left the home to go out. But when he came back, neither Jasmine or Aaliyah were there, and he hasn't seen them since. He told officers that him and Jasmine were intimate with one another, but that they were not in a serious relationship. He denied having anything to do with Jasmine or Aaliyah's disappearance, saying that he would never hurt Aaliyah or any other child. After 24 hours at the police station, the police did not have enough to actually hold him there or arrest him on any charges. There was no sign of Jasmine or Aaliyah, but also no evidence that he had done anything to them. So, for the time being, he was released. Police drove him to a local shopping mall where they told him to wait until forensic examination on the house was complete. But he didn't wait at the mall. He decided to go to the local pub where he drank plenty of beers and got good and drunk. At that time, he went out into the parking lot to have a cigarette. Now, once Robert was released, the media was buzzing about the disappearance of Jasmine and her baby daughter. So, media outlets were out on the prowl for the next story. Well, while outside the pub smoking a cigarette, the local media had spotted Robert and asked him to do an interview, which he agreed to. At that time, he was asked if he was a suspect in the case, and he said yes, of course he is. He described that Jasmine and Aaliyah were his tenants and friends. He said that he would like for them to be found and cannot wait to be cleared of all of this. In the interview, he was clearly intoxicated, struggling to stand upright. Here is a clip of that interview. You were kind of the, the primary suspect in this, in this homicide I still investigation. Am. You, you still are. What are your thoughts about that and what are your emotions right now? What, what's kind of going through your head? It's very stressful, but um, I, ho I hope they will be found and um, I hope we can move forward from this. No, we were, we were friends. Um, absolutely friends um, and supported each other I would like obviously for them to be found um, and um, for me to be cleared of this for the month that followed Robert did other interviews and in those interviews he repeated that Jasmine was just a tenant of his and he doesn't know what happened to her he said that the whole disappearance has been traumatizing for him, and as far as he is concerned, the police have it all wrong by looking into him. He said that Aaliyah was a great kid. Sometimes he would take care of her. She never caused him any issues. He even said that even though this is a homicide investigation, he isn't ready to say that they're dead just yet. Maybe they're just missing. You know, did you hang out with Aaliyah? Did you play with her? Of course, yeah. Of course, I took care of her and she's a great kid and I had no issues with them at all. But isn't it hard to believe that somebody well, would kill it's them? It's crazy. Of course it is. But you're saying that is not you? Of course not. Of course not. So can, why is it... But, 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 who, who, who says that they're dead? That's crazy. I don't know where they are. Meanwhile, as police continued their investigation, they were just hitting dead ends. They were not coming up with anything useful. After several hours of searching the home, they finally decided to let Robert return to his home while they expanded their searches to the surrounding areas. They also checked any and all CCTV cameras in the nearby areas. They did find one camera which showed them at a grocery store, confirming that Jasmine and Aaliyah were both alive as of April 15th, but after that, they are not seen again. Police also were able to search through Robert's phone, and they found that Robert had actually deleted all of the text messages between himself and Jasmine, as well as 36 photos that he had of Jasmine and or Aaliyah. But 
Of course, neither that CCTV footage nor the fact that Robert deleted pictures could prove what happened to Jasmine and Aaliyah. So still, even after searching the wooded areas in town and in the area where Robert said he last saw Jasmine and Aaliyah, after searching through CCTV footage and processing any and all forensic evidence from Robert's home, police were still coming up empty-handed. Based on his behavior in those interviews, as well as the very vague and contradictory answers he was giving, police just knew that Robert was involved, but they couldn't prove it just yet. Detectives decided that they needed to take this investigation to the next level. They started to work on an undercover investigation to try and back Robert into a corner. They called this Operation Highwood, and the goal was to befriend Robert and get him to trust them enough to admit his guilt for Jasmine and Aaliyah's disappearances. By May 5th, 2019, two undercover officers spotted Robert as he was coming out of a liquor store. One of the officers went up to Robert and said that he recognized him from his TV interviews. They called him a rock star because he was all over the TV. And Robert said that he doesn't really feel like a rock star. The undercover agent acted as a local criminal concerned for Robert's freedom. The officer informed Robert that a nosy neighbor found a bag of evidence saying that this bag might be important to him and that he might want to take care of it. Robert seemed intrigued, so the officer offered to drive him to a local pub to get some drinks, to which he agreed. As they spoke and drank some beers, officers said that Robert appeared relaxed and comfortable. He was even making jokes and sharing stories back and forth. After chatting for about an hour, the officer suggested that they meet at the shop, a private location where Robert knew he wasn't being monitored so that they could speak freely. This location was a local warehouse. Once at the shop, the officers basically offered to help Robert get rid of the bag of evidence as long as he works for them and their criminal organization in return. But at first, Robert was very skeptical of these new friends. He asked them multiple times if they were cops, saying, you have to identify yourself if you're really a cop, right? And the undercover officers acted upset and offended that he would even make that suggestion. After a few hours of talking and the officers earning his trust, Robert started to crack. After about four hours of chatting, he started to talk about what happened to Jasmine and Aaliyah. And it was at that time that he confirmed that they were both dead. He told them that officers are looking very, very far away from where they should be. And from my understanding, it seems like the undercover officers offered to help Robert take care of the bodies if he showed them where they were. He told Robert, you'll never have to worry about them again. So, Robert took those undercover officers right to the bodies. In the late night hours of May 5th, he drove about 90 miles, bringing the officers to a remote area near Grizzly Creek in Kananaskis County, where he led the officers down a hill. The officers asked, what are we looking for? Them? And Robert nodded, yes. As they walked past the trees and went deeper into the woods, Robert suddenly stopped. The officer asked, okay, where to? And Robert replied, you're looking at it. The officer replied, this right here, as if he was doubting him. So Robert grabbed a branch and lifted it up to show what's underneath. And the officer sees a bit of blue sticking out to which he believed was a blanket. After that, Robert and the officers left. The following morning, officers returned to the area and dug up the shallow graves, and there, they discovered the bodies of 25-year-old Jasmine Lovett and 22-month-old Aaliyah Sanderson. Robert had murdered both of them, put plastic bags around their heads, then wrapped their bodies in blue blankets before transporting them to this remote, isolated area in the woods and burying them in shallow graves. Now, as Robert was leading the undercover officers to the bodies, he started opening up more about what happened. The officer asked what caused him to have such animosity towards Jasmine, and he said that she wanted too much. The officer asked, like, too much money? Sex? Or what? And Robert replied, she wanted to get effing married. He also said to the officers, you want to know why the cops are mad at me? And explained why he spread that bacon all around his house. 
Why? He said he did that because pork is the closest thing to people, and he was hoping that the cadaver dogs would react to the pork and, I guess, see that it was just bacon so that everything else they reacted to couldn't possibly be accurate. Maybe that was the goal, that if the dogs reacted to the bacon, if they took them out somewhere else and the dog reacted to something else, they would just be like, oh, it's probably nothing. That's probably what Robert's goal was there. After Robert showed the undercover officers where the bodies were located that following day, forensic examiners came to the scene to excavate the bodies and send them to the medical examiner for autopsies. And it was then that the medical examiner found that both Jasmine and Aaliyah had suffered violent, horrific deaths. First, the medical examiner noted that both bodies had a very, very strong smell of gasoline. The ME described that the smell was overwhelming, stronger than any other gasoline smell he's experienced in his 13 years working in forensics. There was also a strong smell of gas in the site where the bodies were found. This might have been done to destroy evidence, there might have been a plan to burn the bodies that never happened, I'm not exactly sure. Jasmine was found to have bruising all over her face and head. She was found to have three different skull fractures, one of which started at the top of her head and the crack went all the way down to the base of her skull. These fractures would have required a significant amount of force. In addition to that, they found that Jasmine suffered from a single gunshot wound behind her left ear. The ME removed several bullet fragments from her head. The medical examiner determined that the bullet hit her brainstem, which would have caused instant death. So, he determined that she was most likely beaten with a blunt object causing those skull fractures. Then, she was shot. On the other hand, little Aaliyah died from blunt force traumatic injuries to her head. She was also found to have abrasions to the side of her face and neck. She had experienced a brain bleed, which most likely would have caused her death within three to six hours after sustaining these injuries. So, this poor baby, not even two years old, was beaten, and then it took several hours for her to die. She probably suffered so much before her death. Finally, by May 7th, 2019, Calgary police arrested and formally charged Robert Leeming with two counts of second-degree murder, and from there, he remained in jail awaiting his trial. When he was taken in and questioned this time, obviously Robert could not make up any more stories about not knowing what happened to Jasmine and Aaliyah. So, he gave a new version of the story. This time, he said that Jasmine had left Aaliyah with him to watch her as she usually did when she went out for a grocery run. He said that during that time, Aaliyah had fallen down the stairs while she was trying to climb up. He thought she was going to be okay at first, so he put her to bed for the time being so I guess she could feel better. I don't really know what the goal was there, but when he went to check on her later, he found her unresponsive and limp. By the time Jasmine got home, she found Aaliyah dead in her bed, and obviously, Jasmine was heartbroken. She was devastated. She accused Robert of doing something to hurt her child, so a heated argument broke out. Things escalated, so Robert grabbed a hammer and hit Jasmine over the head with it at least three times. After hitting her numerous times, she fell to the ground, but he noticed that she hadn't died, so he went and grabbed his rifle, came back, and shot her in the head. He said that he didn't call 911 when Aaliyah originally fell down the stairs because he couldn't find his phone anywhere. Eventually, he ended up finding it in the car, but at that point, it was too late, so he just opted to bury the bodies instead. However, police knew that much of what Robert was saying was a lie. First of all, investigators found out that Robert had been cheating on Jasmine for a while. He even had a new girlfriend who he had been chatting with online for months. This wasn't really a surprise given how adamantly he denied being in a serious relationship with Jasmine. And as I stated earlier, Jasmine had suspected him of cheating for quite a long time. Investigators found that Robert had actually been messaging his new girlfriend continuously the entire night Aaliyah and Jasmine died. Robert said that he found Aaliyah at around 9 p.m. that night and couldn't find his phone to call 911. 
but he was on his phone continuously messaging with the girlfriend at that same time. So, that was a complete lie. Now, at one of the court hearings, the prosecution argued that Jasmine and Robert most likely did have a fight on the night that they were murdered, but they don't think it was over him cheating. Instead, they suggested that it was possible that Jasmine caught Robert harming Aaliyah. According to the prosecution, the medical examiner found injuries to Aaliyah's genital area that occurred within 12 hours of her death meaning it was possible that Robert was sexually abusing the 22-month-old little girl. So, they argued that Jasmine caught him sexually abusing Aaliyah, and that is what actually caused the argument. Of course, Robert denied this, but it could be possible. What else can explain those injuries she had? The medical examiner also said that Aaliyah's head injuries don't suggest a fall. In total, Aaliyah had suffered three injuries to her head, one on the back and one on each side of her head. A fall down the stairs wouldn't cause those injuries. The ME said that she was most likely beaten over her head. They also said that although they can't determine the exact time of death, Aaliyah was killed after Jasmine was killed. So again, she didn't die from falling down the stairs before Jasmine got home. Jasmine was killed first because of some sort of argument and then Aaliyah was murdered after. So, after multiple hearings to discuss the evidence in this case, Robert was set to go to trial for both murders in November of 2022. However, on the first day of trial, Robert actually pleaded guilty to the second-degree murder of Jasmine. But at that time, he refused to accept responsibility for Aaliyah's murder. So, the trial continued for the murder of 22-month-old Aaliyah. In the trial, they discussed pretty much everything that I've told you up to this point, how Robert had lied and lied when they first went missing, how he tried throwing the cops off of his scent until he ultimately agreed to lead undercover officers to their bodies. In the trial, Robert said that he had a feeling that these men were undercover officers, but he led them to the bodies anyways. I don't buy that at all. I think he just felt really stupid that these cops duped him in less than six hours, so he wanted to make it seem like he knew all along. It's really funny how stupid Robert has to be too because normally these types of operations take multiple days, if not weeks, to gain someone's trust, but literally within four hours of talking, he was like, yeah, Let's go see the bodies. They're, they're a couple hours away. Let's go over there. Then, after finding the bodies, the autopsies confirmed that both Jasmine and Aaliyah suffered brutal, horrific deaths. Jasmine had been beaten with a hammer and then shot in her face as she lied on the ground, dying. Then, Aaliyah had also been viciously beaten to death after. At the trial, the prosecution mentioned that Jasmine actually fell pregnant with Robert's baby during the course of their relationship, but she terminated the pregnancy. Then, while living with Jasmine, Robert was seeing other women. So, he was cheating, and all of this probably did hurt Jasmine. However, I will say that, again, even family members suspect that she knew about his cheating, and to me, I don't think this would have caused that big of an argument, knowing that she had already confronted him, she had already accused him of cheating at least once before. That might just be me, but I truly believe whatever caused this intense fight must have been something huge. Because again, they had already had fights about the cheating before. So, why this time would he freak out and do something to Jasmine? Why this time did he kill her? Why not one of the other times that they argued about his cheating? I personally do believe that there is a good chance that Robert was abusing Aaliyah. She had injuries in suspicious places, and if we know anything about Jasmine, it's that her child always comes first. If there was something that Jasmine would blow up about, it's that Robert was hurting her baby. And if she did catch him doing something to her, I think that she would have threatened to expose him, and that can drive someone to freak out and murder somebody else. I don't think her threatening to break up with Robert would have caused this kind of reaction because truly, I don't think he cared enough about his relationship with Jasmine to actually freak out like that. So, I personally, 
personally think that it was over some sort of abuse, something that was going on that Robert desperately wanted to cover up and did not want Jasmine to expose. Then after murdering two people, Robert cleaned himself and the area up. He wrapped them up and planned out where to dispose of the bodies before driving over an hour to dump their bodies in a secluded area where he buried them in a shallow grave and covered them up with branches and other debris. After this, he went back home, spent time with his new girlfriend, and acted normal. He lied to the police, the media, and everybody else. Of course, Robert and his defense were sticking to the story that Aaliyah fell down the stairs by accident. They said that there was no evidence that he actually killed Aaliyah. I'm not going to talk too much about what the defense said because there really wasn't much evidence other than just saying that there's no evidence to show that he actually beat her, so that's why I'm kind of skirting through that part, going through that part pretty quickly. I just want this to be over. It's been a long way. Another difficult day for the families of Jasmine Lovett and Aaliyah Sanderson. The mother and daughter were found dead alongside each other in shallow graves. Robert Leeming, the man on trial, testified he'd beaten Lovett, his girlfriend, with a hammer and shot her in the back of the head. I don't want to remember them that way, but it is important for closure. I've been waiting two and a half years for justice and I just hope it comes for Aaliyah. Don't tell me there's no heaven because I would not be here. I almost lost the will to live over this. Leeming told court he killed Lovett minutes after discovering 22-month-old Aaliyah Sanderson unresponsive in her crib. Under questioning by the Crown Prosecutor Doug Taylor, Leeming agreed instead of staying with her dead baby, Lovett came downstairs to confront him, accusing him of hurting the toddler. When asked why he didn't call 911, run to a neighbor's, or drive to a hospital, having no idea whether or not she could be saved, he testified he wasn't thinking right and couldn't find his phone. Evidence presented by Constable Ian Whiffen after the seizure of Leeming's cell phone reveals he was texting with another woman he was seeing between the hours that he testified he didn't know where his phone was. He told court he was on his laptop at the time Aaliyah fell down the stairs. But an investigator presented evidence that Leeming's computer hadn't been used in almost two weeks before Leeming and Sanderson died. Leeming rejected that finding. Under cross-examination, Leeming admitted to lying to police and lying repeatedly in media interviews. Leeming testified he covered his tracks, putting bacon in the dry sump to throw off cadaver dogs, and sending text messages to Lovett's phone after she was already dead. Leeming told court... It was all a misdirection. Either way, at the end of the trial, both sides made their closing arguments and the jury went in for deliberations. After the deliberations, they came back and found that Robert Leeming is in fact guilty of the violent second degree murder of Aaliyah. For this, Robert was handed a life sentence with the possibility of parole after 22 years served. Of course, Jasmine and Aaliyah's family are happy to see this violent coward behind bars, but no time will ever be enough for what he did to these two innocent victims. And to me, I truly believe that Robert should have been convicted of first-degree murder for both Jasmine and Aaliyah. He beat Jasmine over the head and then noticed she was still alive. He took the time to leave the room, go into another room, grab his gun before coming back and shooting her. As he was walking back with the gun, he had the full intention of killing her. Within the seconds it takes to do that, he had already made the decision and plan to kill her. That is first degree murder. But okay, let's say he pleaded guilty to the lesser charge because he took a deal. Unfortunately, it happens but he still went to trial for Aaliyah's murder. Why wasn't he charged with first degree? Because to me, I think it's pretty obvious and it's pretty safe to say that this was first degree murder. I don't think he killed Aaliyah in a fit of rage. I think as soon as Jasmine was dead, he knew that Aaliyah had to die too. Even if it was right after Jasmine in the same fit of rage, he still took the time to turn his anger towards Aaliyah and choose to kill her. Or if it was later, like the next morning or right before dumping her, he knew that he was going to kill her long before actually doing it. You mean to tell me that he killed Jasmine and planned on doing nothing to Aaliyah, but then she also made him angry at another time and then he lashed out and killed her too? 
that makes absolutely no sense. I think it's really scary that not only a double murderer, but a child murderer can be given such leniency to be charged with second degree murder and then only have to serve 20 years before he is eligible for parole. It's so backwards and anybody capable of such a horrific crime should never see the light of day. But that is what I think and now I want to know what you all think. How do you think this went down? What do you think the argument between Robert and Jasmine was over? Do you think he was harming Aaliyah? Also, do you think that Robert would have been caught if it weren't for those undercover officers? What do you think of the charges he faced and the sentence he got? Let's discuss this and any other thoughts that you have in the comments below. If you like this video, please make sure to go ahead and leave this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Don't forget to turn that notification bell too on so you don't miss out on any of my future videos. Make sure you follow my Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, and now Spotify. All will be linked down below. And if you have any case suggestions, please make sure to fill out the Google form, which is also linked down below. With that, I hope you guys have an amazing week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you next time.